What's up, Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a spectacular day. Today on the homestead, we got to continue along with our seed starting schedule. So today we're going to get our watermelon seeds planted, some seedless and some seeded watermelon seeds. I'm going to tell you all about seedless watermelons, tricks to germinating them from my experiences, how we get seedless watermelons, a lot of good stuff there. And hopefully towards the end of the video, we'll have time to get some lettuce planted. I've got some in the greenhouse that's been ready for a couple weeks and I need to get it in the ground. So let's head on inside the greenhouse and we'll talk more about seedless watermelons. So seedless watermelons. Last year we grew seedless watermelons for the first time and were somewhat successful at it. We didn't knock it out of the park, but we end up getting about 10 to 15 nice seedless watermelons and man, were they good. Okay, you cut it. <laughs> okay, we're gonna cut it. Think ready? I don't know, it's coming apart like it might be. <laughs> oh, look at there. There you go. Grab it with your dirty hands. Just Man, that looks good. <laughs> Yeah. I want you to get this mm. one, Daddy. Here, eat some. Eat okay. that piece. Okay. Mm. Mm. For the first one we cut, we got pretty lucky. Oh, where's this guy, Daddy? There you go. Tessa, right, can I see? Look at that guy right there. We got dirty here. <laughs> Now we hear from a lot of folks who say that the newer seedless watermelon varieties aren't near as good, aren't near as sweet as some of those old timey seeded varieties, but we didn't find that to be the case. I think the reason a lot of people think that is because of what they're getting at the grocery store. So when you go to the grocery store and there's a bin of seedless watermelons there and you pick one out, you have no idea at what level of ripeness it is at. It could be not ripe enough, it could be just right, or it could be too ripe. You're kind of at the mercy of the grower at that point or whoever was picking those watermelons. But when we grew our own seedless watermelons last year and picked them at peak ripeness using all the kind of telltale signs, they were some of the sweetest watermelons I had ever had. So I would say this, don't knock seedless watermelons until you grow them yourself and try them. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at just how sweet they are. Now growing seedless watermelons is a little tricky. And I don't know that I would recommend it to a beginner gardener. I would probably say master just growing seeded watermelons first and then kind of move to seedless watermelons. I definitely wouldn't recommend it to somebody who was just getting into seed starting. You want to kind of have your seed starting technique down pat. The germination of seedless watermelon seed is pretty tricky and then you have to plant them a certain way. So it's not as simple as just going out there throwing some watermelon seeds in the ground or some regular watermelon transplants in the ground. There's a certain way you've got to do it to get the desired results. So maybe not for beginners, maybe more for experienced gardeners, but I'm going to try to explain it in a way so it makes sense for everybody. And hopefully those of you who are willing to take a chance will give it a try. So first let's talk about something that is really confusing to a lot of people. If a seedless watermelon doesn't have any seeds in it, how do you plant a seedless watermelon? I'm going to try to explain this as simply as I can. I've got some graphics we're going to throw up on the screen here. Now, first, let's kind of explain chromosome number because that plays big into how you eventually get a seedless watermelon. So we'll throw this graphic up on the screen here, which has a little drawing of a chromosome and talks about the different number of sets of chromosomes that something can have. So in biological terms, we use the variable N to help us explain the number of sets of chromosomes that something might have. Now your gametes or your sperm, your egg cells, or in the case of plants, pollen and egg cells only have one set of chromosomes. So we use just the variable N to designate that. So traditionally in plants, we have a pollen cell, which has one set of chromosomes, an egg cell, which has one set of chromosomes. When the pollen fertilizes the egg, that individual now has two sets of chromosome. We call it diploid. And so the seed that would result from that fertilization would be a diploid seed, or it would have two sets of chromosomes per every cell. And that is what you have with a traditional seeded watermelon seed. All the cells in it have 
two copies of each chromosome. But to get something that's sterile, we need three copies of each chromosome. And that happens in humans with Down syndrome, which is frequently called trisomy 21, which means there are three copies of the 21st chromosome. So if we want to achieve sterility, if we want a seedless watermelon, we need it to have three copies of each chromosome. And in the case of seedless watermelons, we get the situation where we have four copies of each chromosome, what we call tetraploid cells. And so seedless watermelon seeds are tetraploid. Each cell in that seed has four copies of each chromosome. So now that we've kind of defined the whole chromosome set situation, let's look at how a traditional watermelon is fertilized. So for a seeded watermelon, which ends up being diploid or 2N, we have pollen from the male flower, which is haploid, one copy of each chromosome. We have the egg in the female flower, which is haploid as well, one copy of each chromosome. When that pollen fertilizes the egg, we get two copies of each chromosome, the diploid individual or the seeded watermelon. But with seedless watermelons, like I mentioned earlier, we need a triploid individual. We need three sets of each chromosome to get that sterility and that lack of seed. So how do we do that? So the way the plant breeders do this is they take a typical seeded watermelon seed, plant it, when it forms a seedling, they treat that seedling with a chemical called colchicine. And this is not a harsh chemical by any means. It's used to treat gout in humans, so it's nothing terribly harmful for you. But what that colchicine does is it doubles the chromosome number. So we have a plant that was diploid with two sets of each chromosome. We treat it with colchicine. Now we have a tetraploid seedling, and all the seeds that that plant produces are going to be tetraploid as well. So when that tetraploid seed, the seed with four copies of each chromosome, is planted and it produces flowers, the female flower is going to contain eggs with two copies of each chromosome as opposed to one in the seeded watermelon case. Tetraploid plants don't really produce a lot of pollen, but the pollen would be diploid as well with two copies of chromosome. But in this case, we're really focused on the egg in the female flower. So to get a seedless watermelon, we have to plant these tetraploid or 4N seeds in the same plot as some standard watermelon seeds, 2N or diploid seeds. And when those pollinate, that's where we get three sets of chromosomes. So I mentioned to you that the tetraploid or seedless watermelon seeds don't produce a lot of pollen. So we have an egg there from the tetraploid seed that has two copies of each chromosome. We have the pollen grains from the diploid or standard watermelon we planted, which has one copies of each chromosome. When that one end pollen fertilizes that two end egg, we get three copies of each chromosome. We get a triploid individual that is sterile. And that, my friends, is how we get a seedless watermelon. Now, some people will say, well, that just doesn't seem natural. That's playing with genetics too much. I don't want to eat anything that's been modified like that. And if that's the way you feel, that's fine. Go ahead and grow the regular seeded watermelons. But with my kids, it's a lot easier to grow the seedless ones. They like the seedless ones a lot better. I like them a lot better because you don't have to fight through those seeds. If that's not a big deal for you, just grow the seeded ones. I'm just kind of explaining the differences and how we get to a seedless watermelon. So now that we've explained how we get a seedless watermelon, let's talk about what we're doing this year compared to what we did last year. So last year we grew a seedless variety called Summer Breeze. It was a red seedless watermelon. Made a watermelon about not that big, maybe like a basketball size, and they were really good. We used a variety called Carolina Cross as the pollinizer. Got to have the pollinizer in there just like I showed you earlier. And that's a giant watermelon variety, and that worked pretty good. From what I understand, the pollinizer doesn't necessarily have to be the same color as the seedless variety that you plant. A lot of seed companies, for instance, Johnny's, when I bought my seedless seeds for this year, they included a pollinizer called Ace, which is supposed to produce a lot of pollen. It's not really a good watermelon to eat, but it produces a lot of pollen, so you get a lot more seedless watermelons. My technique, on the other hand, is a little different. I'd rather not just grow a watermelon that I can't eat, so I wanna grow an edible pollinizer, 
I may sacrifice a little bit of production on the seedless side, but at least I'll be able to eat the pollinizer. And so that's kind of my game plan. Now last year, in addition to that summer breeze seedless and that Carolina cross giant watermelon, we also planted a variety, an orange variety, a seeded orange variety called Orange Crunch. That's what I believe it was called. And the kids really like the orange watermelon and I really like the orange watermelon. So this year we're gonna to try to grow an orange seedless variety we got this variety here called orange crisp which to me looks like the seedless version of that orange crunch that we grew last year and then for my pollinizer i'm going with this tender sweet orange variety here i got these seeds from morgan county seeds they were dirt cheap i think it was nine bucks for a quarter pound so i just went ahead and got plenty of seeds here these seedless seeds are pretty pricey like I said, these seeds were pretty cheap. So we want to be really careful with these seeds and we want to do our best to give them the most optimal germination conditions. And as far as how many transplants you're going to need of each, the seedless and the seeded variety, it's a three to one ratio. So you need three seedless plants for every one pollinizer or seeded plant. Now in a backyard garden situation, the way we'll do it is along the row there, we'll plant three seedless transplants and then plant one seeded transplants, then three more of these, then one more of these. In a big field situation, I've seen it done where they'll plant three rows of seedless transplants and then one row of the seeded transplants. But that's on a huge, you know, 100 acre scale or so. For a backyard garden, we like to break it up between the row three to one. So let's take a look at what we're gonna be planting these in, and then we'll talk about some of the difficulties of germinating seedless watermelon seed. So we've got us a PropTech 162 tray here, filled with soil almost completely. We left these two open lanes down the middle here to kind of give us a division between our seedless transplants, the orange crisp, and our seeded transplants, the tender sweet orange. Now, as I told you earlier, we're only planting one of these seeded transplants per every three of these seedless transplants. So I won't need near this many seeded transplants. But because these seeds were dirt cheap, like I said, I'm gonna go ahead and plant a bunch of extras here just in case they don't germinate. And I'm pretty sure I can give away some of these watermelon transplants uh, to some friends and stuff. So we're gonna grow some extra of the seeded transplants although we won't need near that many to uh, pollinate or pollinize however you want to say it this many seedless transplants so in our seedless seed packet here it says we have 50 seeds well i counted these earlier and there's actually 55 seeds in there so i've got marked off here six lanes each lane has nine cells in it so six times nine gives me 54 cells to plant there and then we'll plant how many ever cells this is for the seeded variety. Now I mentioned to you earlier that these seedless watermelon seeds are pretty tricky to germinate and they are. I experienced that firsthand last year. I did end up with enough transplants to make it work but I planted a lot more seeds and I eventually got transplants and that frustrates a lot of people because these seeds like I said are really expensive and if they don't come up for you you feel like you've wasted twenty dollars or how much ever you spent on seeds so we're going to try to refine our seedless watermelon germination process this year take some things we learned from last year apply it to this year and hopefully get much better germination so as far as growing the watermelons I didn't find it was that tough once we put them in the ground at the recommended planting ratio that I talked about earlier. It's just getting these things to germinate, getting some viable transplants. That's the real tricky part. Now online, I found a nice document that was done by the University of Nebraska that gave some really good seedless watermelon germination tips. So we're gonna go through kind of those four big tips there and talk about how we're gonna follow those tips. So tip number one they had was use a light potting mix well we've got that pro mix which is about as light as you can get so check for number one and the second big tip here is do not overwater these seedless watermelon seeds and that was where i messed up last year i was watering them at the same rate or the same amount as everything else that i was starting in seed trays and that's a big no no you really only want to water them once 
and then wait for them to germinate. We've got a little trick that I did last year that I'm going to show you in a little bit that's going to keep us from overwatering them. But the big thing with these seedless seeds is do not overwater them. The third tip I read, which I did not do last year, but I did do this year, and I've already done it, and I would show you, but it was just such a specific process it was hard to get the camera focused in on it and that is to nick or scarify the seeds so on a watermelon seed it's got a pointy end and kind of a rounded end and supposedly if you just nick a little bit off that rounded end there it will help that seed absorb water faster and help it germinate better so i dumped out i was at my desk earlier i dumped out all these seeds all 55 of them on this little notepad here and I took my knife and I just barely cut off some of that rounded end of the seed to kind of nick them. Obviously if you were doing uh, hundreds of seeds this probably wouldn't be feasible but for 50 seeds or less it wasn't you know it didn't take me too long. So we nicked the round end of the seed and hopefully that helps. And the fourth big tip that the University of Nebraska had had to do with temperature. A constant 85 degrees and we can do that in here it's pretty warm in here today I had to raise the uh, windows earlier we've got our heat mat and I've been able to keep this thing upwards of 95 to 100 degrees if I want to now I don't want it getting quite that hot so I'll raise the windows if it gets that toasty in here so I'm going to have to play with a little bit but I'm going to set my thermostat at 85 degrees and try to keep it there and we should be able to do that pretty easily but it needs that constant temperature from what I understand it doesn't like the kind of lows and highs that you might experience you know outside we need to create a constant environment in this greenhouse around 85 degrees at least for the for for, for the first three or four days. So hopefully those tips were helpful and if you're watching on YouTube, I'll put a link to that document in the description below. There's also lots of other good tips on there about actually growing the seedless watermelons, but those were kind of the big four germination tips that I read. Okay, so let's get these puppies planted. I've got my Pro Mix here pre-moistened and let's just make some indentions here for our seeds. And we want to carefully get our seeds out of here. Like I said, I've already pulled these out one time to nick the edges of the seeds. And the camera won't focus in good enough for me to show you. But there's a good bit of difference between the way these seeds look here and the way those seeded watermelon seeds look there. So we're just going to put one seed per cell with these. And for the space I'm going to plant, I probably won't need 54 seedless watermelon transplants. But I was just kind of planning for having a less than stellar germination rate like I had last year. That's why I went ahead and got the 50 pack of seeds. Hopefully our germination rate is much better. I'd like to have more than enough transplants than not enough, but that's why I got so many here just so I can make sure to get things nice and germinated. I got a double in there somewhere and get it out. There we go. In reality, I probably only need about 25 plants to plant the space that I'm going to plant. So if we can just get half of these puppies to germinate, that'll be good with me. If we get better than that, I'll just be plum tickle. Okay, so we got those in. That seed pack is empty. Now let's plant these cheap watermelon seeds, this tender sweet orange. I hear this is a pretty good variety, so we should enjoy it as well. If you want a good deal on watermelon seeds, I would highly recommend checking out Morgan County Seeds. They don't have a ton of varieties, but the varieties they do have, a good deal on the seeds there. I'm still just going to put one seed per cell in here because these seeds are kind of big. And we've got enough cells here, way more than we're going to need. So we should get plenty of transplants to use. And if for some odd reason, none of these seedless watermelon seeds germinate we'll just plant all the seeded variety here and we'll be happy with that we're just going to be prepared to try and grow some orange seedless ones but we'll also have us a plan b we're going to grow some watermelons either way we'll just see what kind of watermelons we end up growing all right so we got one watermelon seed per cell and every cell with the exception of these open lanes here now my perlite trick go dogs is going to be especially 
helpful with watermelons. I mentioned that we don't want to keep these things too wet. We don't want to overwater, and that's what the perlite is going to do. It's going to help keep that surface nice and dry so these seeds don't get too wet or waterlogged. This is the way the big boys do it. This is the way I've been doing it for the last year or so, and it works like a charm. We'll do our seedless side here. And I'm going to give these a little splash of water here. Because I am prone to overwatering stuff, we're going to wrap this end of the tray. So there won't be no temptation to water these guys anymore. They're going to be wrapped up and I won't be able to water them until they start germinating. So we're going to take some saran wrap here. And this can be a little bit aggravating. We're going to try to make it work. Maybe if I take it out of the box, it'll work better. And we'll cut that off. Put that back in the kitchen so I don't get fussed at. And we'll try to seal this off a little bit on the bottom here. And there we go. Nice and sealed off. So last year I did this trick as well with the second round of seedless seeds that I planted. So the first round I planted, I didn't cover them or didn't wrap them, and I didn't get very good germination at all. The second round, I wrapped them and got better germination, but the mistake I made, I think, was taking the saran wrap off too early. The impulse is when you see a few of those seeds or those seedlings pop in there, oh, I got to take this saran wrap off so I don't suffocate them. But in actuality, you want to wait till a majority of them do germinate. So I think last year I took the wrap off a little too early. This year we're going to leave it on there until we see a significant portion of those seeds germinating and then we'll take it off. And we're still got to be careful with giving them too much water even when we take this off. So those are kind of my trial and error experiences with growing seedless watermelons and germinating seedless watermelon seeds. Hopefully we do better this year than we did last year. Either way, we're going to have some watermelons. We just don't know if we're going to have a bunch of seeded watermelons or maybe some seedless and seeded watermelons. And if you have been successful at this seedless watermelon thing at any level, please do share any additional tips you may have in the comments below. And now for a little lettuce planting. So we've got a good many lettuce transplants here that are past ready to go in the ground, go dogs. We've got some of this alkindus lettuce that has given us trouble, hasn't always germinated the best for us, but we've got a few viable transplants of that. So I'm excited about trying that. That's a red butterhead. We've got some leaf lettuce, some remains, some regular butterhead in there. And then over here, which I don't think I thinned out. I might have to thin it out while we're planting. Is this Yetakule lettuce that a viewer sent us, and I have also been informed Baker Creek carries this variety. So we got a lot of lettuce here. We're not going to come close to planting all this. We're just going to plant one row with a variety here of all these different types. Now I'm kind of in an odd spot as far as figuring out where to put this lettuce because even though we've got 10 plots, all these plots either have stuff planted in them, will have stuff planted in them soon, or have a cover crop that I haven't turned over yet, which tells me I got to get busy turning over some of these cover crops and get my ground ready, especially considering how warm it is outside this week. I don't know if we're going to have another frost or not. But I do have a little extra room on the end of this tater plot here. I always like to do this, leave me a little space to just throw in a row of something random there on the end of each plot. So we got seven rows of taters here. They've been planted about two and a half weeks. Still no signs of vegetation emerging from the soil, but everything's been pretty dry. We did get a little sprinkle the other night and I've scratched around in there. I've got some good root formation, just no leaves popping up yet, but I don't think anything's rotted. The conditions have been great so we're just kind of holding pat and waiting till we see some leaves there but right here i've got about four foot to work with and that's plenty of room to squeeze in a row of lettuce and i think since i've got so many transplants i'll go ahead and plant a double row so i'm gonna grab the wheel hoe make a furrow here put some 855 in that furrow i'll close it up because we're not using drip in this plot make me a little nice double furrow there 
so we can plant a double row of lettuce. All right, so we got this little double furrow formed here so we can plant our lettuce on double rows, which I like to do. I'm gonna have to water this stuff as soon as I plant it because these transplants are a little dry and it's hot out here today. But you can see we got a nice root ball formed. So we're gonna start off with this Tropicana leaf lettuce variety. I grew this this past fall and really liked it. Make some nice big heads. The heads don't tighten up like a romaine or a butterhead, but it's a really good lettuce variety, really good flavor on it. And probably gonna put these close to 12 inches apart, probably 10 to 12 inches apart like this. And we'll do them on both sides of the row here for our double row. We'll just stagger them like this. That one there looks pretty pitiful. Kind of stagger them so they all have plenty of room there. So we did about a quarter of the row with that Tropicana leaf lettuce. Now we're gonna come in here with some of this Sparks Romaine. This also is a variety I grew for the first time this past fall. We really liked it. So that's why we're planting it again. This does make some nice tight heads on it. Really good Romaine lettuce variety. And then we'll go with a few row feet of this Adriana butterhead variety, kind of a tried and true butterhead variety for us, one that we had grown before, but it had been a little while. We grew it again this year, and it impressed us as always. Then we'll come in here with some of this Alkindus, if I can get them out of here. Oh, I'm gonna lose all my transplants. We didn't get a chance to try this this past fall because our seeds didn't germinate very well and I just wasted two of them because they didn't pull out of the tray like all the others did but we'll get a few in here to try nice pretty red butterhead there and then lastly we've got this Turkish lettuce this Yeta Kool-Aid lettuce and the lady that sent me these said that this stuff will get bitter if it gets real hot so we're gonna have to keep a close eye on this we may have to harvest it before we want to. But we'll keep an eye on it. I gotta thin these out a little bit because I forgot to do that in the greenhouse. Got some decent little plugs there. Just way too many seeds per cell. We'll get them thinned out and get them in here. All right, all right, all right. We got them planted. And I gotta get some water on these puppies ASAP because they are not liking this heat today. But we got our Tropicana leaf lettuce, Sparks Romaine, Adriana Butterhead, Alkindus Red Butterhead, and the Yeta Kool Aid down there at the end. And whereas the lettuce that we grow in the fall and winter months tends to hold pretty well because the temperatures are cool, as things are warming up now, we gotta be real careful with this stuff. We gotta be real timely with our harvest. If it starts looking like it's ready, we got to get it out of here because it can get bitter if it gets stressed and it can go to seed real quick like. So we can't fool around with this like we do growing it in the fall and winter. But it was good to get those planted, make some more room in the greenhouse there. Like I said, they should have been planted a couple weeks ago, but at least we finally got it done. So I hope you enjoyed our little seedless watermelon jam session today and getting this lettuce planted. Don't forget to let me know in the comments below if you've got any good seedless watermelon tips that you can share with me. If you've never tried growing seedless watermelons and you're pretty good at regular watermelons, I would encourage you to give it a try at least one time. I think you'll be pleased with the results if you are able to grow some. Like I said, the ones we grew last year were so sweet and so good. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to check out our affiliate links below. A lot of good companies that we use in our gardens here at Lazy Dog Farm and even some coupon codes for some of those companies. If you haven't already, go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com, where we've got some Lazy Dog Farm merch, our garden journal, recipes, and a lot of other good stuff. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Mm -hmm. By the beauty of your life